Hello, America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to the Neo Fusionist Book Review. This is not your typical book review, as I make no claims to political or philosophical impartiality. This podcast uses the format of a book review to explore the premise of Neo Fusionism. Neo Fusionism is the merging of paleoconservatism with naturalism within the framework of the revitalization of the Republican Party. We will be exploring politics, philosophy, psychology, economics, and sociology through a wide variety of books published both recently and historically. Thank you for tuning in. So for today's episode, we will be reading a book called A Handbook for Right-Wing Youth. This is written by Julius Evola, and we've looked at another of Evola's books uh, already thus far in this podcast, so this is the first author that we're getting to his second book. Uh, this actually was not published during Evola's lifetime, but wasn't published until after he passed away. It's a collection of essays uh, that he wrote in a variety of publications and was collected uh, by Hungarian traditionalists and published in Hungarian in 2012 and then was translated and published in English in 2017. So um, Evola, uh, as I mentioned in the previous a review of his books. He is a uh, traditionalist with a capital T uh, by which he means and, and it is meant that he looks back through um, spiritual and, and religious traditions going back uh, well before the rise of Christianity and, and in drawing from influences from a wide variety of different religious and spiritual traditions to uh, sort of seek out what is known as the perennial philosophy, uh, sort of a, a unifying uh, theory of all of these different ancient uh, religious traditions. Um, I am sort of seeking to put together a, a sort of a, a pre-liberal conservatism or a, 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 re- a collection of right-wing pre-liberal thought to help me build uh, some of the ideas that I'm exploring in this podcast. And I'm also especially interested in, say, a pre-Christian, which is why I'm really interested in the philosophy, particularly of the ancient Greeks, and I'll be going into more detail in that uh, in some future episodes. And Evola talks a bit about some pre-Christian traditions, and he can be sometimes critical of, of Christianity and that's something that I'm really interested in, these pre-Christian conservatism. And so that sort of draws me to Evola because that's an area that he explores. Now, of course, that leaves some ideas that um, that I disagree with. I'm much more of a materialist, and I don't really believe in any sort of spiritual or supernatural realm that's kind of the naturalism part of this podcast is is to see how um how conservatism and right-wing ideas can fit with a materialist naturalist understanding of reality so that runs sort of contrary to the whole premise of looking for this ancient traditional uh ideas but I do think that there's a lot to be uh, a lot of value to be found in some of these ancient uh, ancient belief systems and ancient systems of virtue, and I think it's very much worth exploring. So on the one hand, um, I like a lot of Evola's work, but I'm also skeptical of a lot of Evola's uh, work and a lot of his his ideas. Or I think that it needs to be interpreted in a certain manner. Uh, which isn't the way that necessarily that he interprets it. He's very much to say that, you know, conservatism and right-wing thought require a spiritual um, understanding of the world and the prioritizing of the spiritual over the material. And uh, and that's something that I am going to sort of have to struggle with because, you know, I, I, I like I said, I, I want to explore these ancient virtue, ancient systems of virtue but I also need to sort of extract them from the supernatural um, uh, uh, framework in which they're presented. So with that said, I'm going to go in and start looking at some of the essays in this book. So it's called A Handbook for Right-Wing Youth, and these essays, which are drawn from a wide variety of time periods and uh, publications, they, they span 40 years. The first was, I believe the earliest one in here is from 1933, and the latest one 
is from 1973. So you've got a span of 40 years over which these various essays were published. So there's a wide variety of circumstances in which Evola is writing, and he does write some about uh, the current events of the time, which I think is interesting. He, he hits on a lot about the youth movement of the time, and that's why those are included in this book. He, he, he talks a little bit about what it means to be right-wing, and he talks a little bit about what it means to be youthful and young. And, and, and so all of these kind of hit on those topics, and that's what pulls them together in this book. Um, now, Evola lived in Italy. He was an Italian, and so a lot of the current events that are mentioned and the movements that are mentioned in this book tie into Italian politics and Italian movements. Uh, and so some of it may seem a little bit, um, you know, ob obscure uh, when he mentions certain things that are going on in Italy at the time for the American audience that I'm making this podcast for. Um, and so we'll just have to kind of bear with some of those some of those concepts as we go. Uh, and and the, the real question is here here is how can we interpret this and apply this to modern America? So with that said, I'm going to go in and start reading some of these essays. Essentially, there are, I believe, 17 essays in total in this book. Uh, the first one, that I want to read is from 1952 and this essay is called Outlining the Ideal, the Trial of Air. And so uh, he says, quote, ancient initiation rites would require a neophyte to pass an inner trial, symbolically referred to as the trial of water or even the trial of air. In everyday material life, we are used to solid things, which provide something unyielding to hold on to, thus giving us some support, even when it is a matter of reacting against them. This is the non-I, of which the I usually stands in need, in order to perceive itself, almost by way of contrast. The neophyte would be asked to display a capacity for active engagement, even in the absence of any support of this kind even when not having a solid, consistent, and resistant element such as earth around or below him, but a fluid one such as air or water. The neophyte could therefore prove his freedom, the faculty of performing an act which was truly his own, coming from within. All this might also be applied to the political domain, in particular with regard to the forces and men of the National Front, starting with the MSI, that is the Italian social movement. It would be interesting to make such forces and men undergo a trial of air. This is what we mean. Let us suppose that the current government should suddenly fall, that the exceptional laws were revoked and many injustices redressed, that Article 16 were abolished, and so on. In other words, let us suppose that at a given moment an all-clear were issued. Well, what would happen under such circumstances? Would we witness a capacity analogous to that of the neophytes who pass the trial of air? Or is it rather the case that some would undergo a crisis, while others would remain speechless? This is precisely how things stand. If we leaf through the more nationalist-oriented newspapers, we find that most of them are almost exclusively filled with polemics, attacks, and criticism. This means that most of the forces are mobilized in reaction to the enemy, that they find their raison d'etre in the latter and are, so to speak, activated by him. But what if the enemy ceased to be? For many, that would be a sad day. They would no longer know what to say, write, or do. At any rate, what they would say, write, and do would be out of joint with what would be expected of them, based on their previous polemical and aggressive stance. Here, we are not referring so much to the practical side. That is, we are not asking to what extent trained cadres are to be found in our ranks, men of an adequate stature, knowledge, and expertise to replace the current political class at the hypothetical moment of the all-clear, and to establish the true, organic, monolithic state. Let us take the level of doctrine. 
As is well known, many people ask themselves, ultimately, what does the MSI want? What do national forces want? It is difficult to give this question a clear answer in terms of doctrine. The problem of pro- or anti-Atlanticism, that of tactical coalitions or alliances, the relationship with the church, and so on, are only strategic issues and contingent questions. And in any case, a clear solution to them could only be found starting from a well-defined doctrine concerning the values and principles of political organization. Only very few among the writers and intellectuals of the MSI take an interest in these topics and go beyond generic formulas, catchwords, and vague patriotic references. In fact, the situation is such that it would be better for them not to do anything of the sort, because if one were really to follow them and believe that what one is fighting for is their political ideal, the consequences which would be drawn from it would be rather grievous. For the few ideological insights that have been adequately defined betray socialist tendencies that are more than dubious and, in our view, represent a genuine betrayal of the main party line, which is rather in keeping with the highest European political tradition. Those few intellectuals or journalists with the wrong vocation aside, what we find is almost a vacuum in what ought to be a central area, the area of pure political doctrine. With reference, let me stress this once again, to positive formulations, as opposed to polemical or contingent ones. Is it fear? Is it aversion towards any form of intellectual discipline? But this is like fighting aimlessly in hand-to-hand -hand combat with no general staff, with no army, in which individual actions are coordinated and acquire meaning in the light of well-defined objectives. The predominant situation is this. Pro-MSI publications increasingly tend to feature articles that set out from the subject of the day to launch attacks and polemics, rather than articles which focus on ideas and contribute to defining some principles, a style, and a view of life in the state. This is an issue on which those harboring revolutionary ideals should also reflect. It is worth bearing in mind that the main revolutions in Europe were preceded by a precise doctrinal preparation. Such was the case both with the French Revolution and the Communist and National Socialist ones. It was far less the case with fascism, where activism largely preceded doctrine, hence the weaknesses and ambiguities of the fascist system. Lending form to the ideal, lending form to some cadres, this is the essential task. And in our cases, the existing circumstances might even be conducive to this goal. If Skelba's repressive measures were really to be applied, one might take advantage of this to limit any exterior, polemical, or simply aggressive expression as far as possible so, to fo so as to focus instead on the inner dimension and thus carry out serious preparative work. It was in exile and silence that Lenin formulated, systematically and lucidly, the doctrine destined to overthrow old Russia. It was in prison that Hitler laid down the ideological positions for his struggle. All this springs not from mere activism, from reacting and striking here or there, but from the building up of an intensity which retains the seed of an impetus for a more renovating force. End quote. So there you have uh, the entirety of that of that short essay there, and essentially he's he's describing an ancient uh, occult system of the uh, the ritual of air or the trial of air or the trial of water, which which was a a system whereby someone being initiated into into a um, esoteric tradition um, would be forced to. Uh, define and explain themselves. Now, I don't know an awful lot about this uh, tr trial of air that he talks about, and he doesn't really say an awful lot about it, but the idea is to be able to define yourself and define what you stand for and represent and what you believe without opposing or connecting it to anything else, without saying, well, well, what we're for is is the elimination of progressivism in the government or the elimination of communism or the elimination of fascism or the elimination of this or that or whatever. We're going to push against this. We're going to we're going to advance this uh, particular group here 
Um, but to, to not attach oneself or one's set of ideas to anything else and, and, and sort of instead postulate a set of premises that can stand on their own and he, he uses the phrase positive as opposed to negative to say instead of instead of saying I'm against this or I'm against that or I'm anti whatever, uh, but to say that I'm pro this, that or the other, that I support this, that or the other system. This is the system. If the government were to fall, if all of the existing scenarios and relations and network of, of whatever were to were to vanish and it was up to us or up to me or anyone else uh, to to lay out the definition for what we want things to look like going forward, what would that be like? And he puts that forward as a sort of a challenge to say, you know, you, you have to define yourself, you have to have a plan for what you want to do if you didn't have any circumstantial or contingent scenarios in the in the in the here and now that you had to deal with what would your perfect system look like you have to have that defined what would it look like and why and that's the foundation of a doctrine and without it it's just a polemic it's just a it's just a uh, uh, an argument against something and i think that's important for uh, for the modern conservative movement and for say the you know the modern uh, national conservatives or or paleo conservatives or what have you um, or even for myself in trying to put forward this sort of neo-fusionist idea it's important for, for for me to have an idea of this is what this is what it looks like this is what i want to have happen and not just um you know well the democrats are are doing this or the democrats are doing that and, and we see that a lot in the modern conservative movement when it comes to say um hillary clinton or obama or aoc or what have you there are people i know that i talk to that uh are are republicans and and um they they concern themselves with politics or they they'll consider themselves fairly politically aware to some extent uh, but all of their all of their topic of conversation is always well you know Hillary did this or did you see what AOC is, is said or did you see what Bernie said or, or whatever it says it's like this and and you know it's like 2019 now it's ha more than half past 2019 and people are still going after Hillary you know in some cases, people are still going after Obama. Um, but like, you know, and I, and I might say, well, you know, can you name a single Republican other than Donald Trump? And I, I've had people say, no, <laughs> you know, they can name more Democrats than Republicans because their whole system is built, their whole idea is built on opposition. I oppose this person. I'm My whole thing theory is about I'm going to attack this person, attack that person, um, attack this or that idea, but don't have anything they support, don't have any politicians they support, don't have any policies necessarily that they support. I mean, there might be some, but it's usually built on opposition. And frankly, that's just not enough. And that's what Evla is saying in here. You have to have a doctrine that you stand for. You have to have an army that you support. You have to have people that you support. You have to have a system that you are advancing and not just existing in a state of opposition. Uh, that's not adequate. And so I think that's an important point to make. And I and I appreciate that. And so, um, so that was one that I wanted to read. Now, the next one that I want to read is called What It Means to Belong to the Right. And this one's from 1973, so this is one of his later um, essays, and uh, and I think this starts to sort of answer that question to some extent of what it actually means to be on the right. And this is another short essay, so he doesn't go into a lot of detail in any of this one either, um, but it can at least give us some food for thought in some area that we can maybe say, well, is that really what we stand for? Is that what I stand for? Uh, is that workable? Um, so, uh, so let me go ahead and read this uh, essay. He says, quote, Right and left are designations which refer to an already crisis-ridden political society. 
They did not exist in traditional regimes, at any rate not according to the meaning currently assigned to them. In such regimes an opposition could be found, yet it was never a revolutionary one that challenged the system. Rather, it was a loyalist and, in a way, functional opposition. This was the case in England, for instance, where one could speak of His Majesty's Most Loyal Opposition. Things changed with the emergence of subversive movements in recent times. As is widely known, right and left originally referred to the place occupied by the opposite parties in Parliament. The term right acquires different meanings according to one's plane of reference. There is an economic right, based on capitalism, which does not lack some degree of legitimacy provided it does not abuse its position. Its antitheses are socialism and Marxism. As for the political right, strictly speaking it acquires its full meaning only in relation to a monarchy within an organic state. This has especially been the case in Central Europe and partly in conservative England. Yet it is also possible to leave all institutional assumptions aside and speak of the right as a spiritual orientation and worldview. Aside from opposing democracy and all socialist myths, belonging to the right means upholding the values of tradition as spiritual, aristocratic, and warrior values, possibly with reference to a strict military tradition, as in the case of Prussianism, for instance. Moreover, it means harboring a certain contempt for intellectualism and for the bourgeois fetishism of the cultured man, the scion of an ancient Piedmontese family paradoxically exclaimed, I divide the world into two classes, the nobility and those with a degree, while Ernst Younger, for his part, praised a healthy illiteracy as an antidote. Belonging to the right also means being conservative, yet not in a static sense. The obvious assumption is that there remains something worth conserving, which raises a difficult problem in relation to the recent past of Italy after its unification. 19th century Italy has hardly left us any legacy of higher values that are worth safeguarding and which might serve as a foundation. Going even further back in time, right-wing positions are only sporadically to be found in Italian history. What is missing is a molding unitary force of the sort occurring in other countries which have acquired solidity through the ancient monarchist traditions of an oligarchy. Be that as it may, what the claim that the right must not be characterized by static conservatism means is that certain values and underlying ideas must indeed be there as a firm foundation but must be expressed in different ways, in keeping with the times, so as not to let oneself be overtaken by them. This enables one to avoid being left behind and to grasp, govern, and absorb anything that may emerge as the context changes. It is only in this sense that a man of the right may conceive of progress, and not as a mere forward movement, as is all too often held to be the case, especially on the left. In this context, Bernanos quite rightly speaks of an escape forward. Progressivism is a whim alien to any right-wing stance. This is also the case because with respect to the course of history in general, and in particular to spiritual values, as opposed to material values, technological achievements, and so on, the man of the right tends to detect a fall, not any progress or genuine ascent. The developments taking place in present-day society are bound to confirm this belief. A right-wing stance is necessarily anti-collectivist, anti-plebeian, and aristocratic. Its positive counterpart is thus to be found in the affirmation of the ideal of a well-structured, organic, and hierarchical state governed by a principle of authority. Here, certain difficulties emerge with regard to the issue of from where this principle may draw its foundation and consecration. Obviously, it cannot come from below, from the demos, which, pace the Mazinians of yesterday and today, does not express the voice of God at all, if anything the very opposite. 
One must also rule out dictatorial and Bonapartist solutions, which can only be transiently valid in emergency situations and under contingent provisional terms. Once again, we are forced to refer to dynastic continuity, provided, in the case of a monarchical regime, that what we have in mind is so-called authoritarian constitutionalism. What this means is a kind of power that is not merely representative, but also active and regulating on the level of decision-making, as already discussed by de Maistre and Donoso Cortez with reference to ultimate decisions, with all the personal responsibilities this entails, when direct intervention is required because the present order has entered into crisis or new forces are looming on the political horizon. Let us repeat, however, that the rejection of static conservatism in such terms does not concern the sphere of principles. For the man of the right, principles always constitute a solid foundation, a bedrock in the face of change and contingency. Here, the catchword must always be counter-revolution. If we like, we may adopt the only apparently paradoxical formula of conservative revolution, this concerns all those initiatives that are required in order to remove negative situations of the factual sort, which is a necessary step for restoration and for any suitable recovery of what possesses intrinsic value and cannot be called into question. Indeed, in conditions of crisis and subversion, nothing has a more revolutionary character than the recovery of such values. The ancient saying, old things become new with use, highlights precisely the same context, the kind of renewal which can achieve a recovery of what is ancient, namely the immutable heritage of tradition. With this, we believe that the stance of the man of the right has been adequately clarified, end quote. Okay, so, you know, this is another, that's another not very long essay. That's the entirety of it, what it means to belong to the right. And so I think it becomes clear by reading this that Evla is a monarchist. He wants to see um, an organic hierarchy. Let's look at some of the terms that he uses. Uh, he he says uh, he says uh, quote a right wing stance is necessarily anti collectivist, anti plebeian, and aristocratic. So um, so you know and you know obviously he kind of defines it in opposition to something here, which it's just how it goes but he also uh, puts forward a, a proposal a bit of a proposal he says its positive counterpart is thus to be found in the affirmation of the ideal of a well-structured organic and hierarchical state governed by a principle of authority so what he wants to see is a is a hierarchy a state of of organic hierarchy which he understands to be a monarchy um that people have natural positions within a hierarchy and and that's kind of the basis his his idea of the basis for right wing um but that it's fundamentally organic uh and and you know we've we we will see elsewhere um that hierarchies are are f fundamental parts of life uh for for people everywhere and and even for animals as we start to explore um evolutionary psychology and biology and whatnot there's nothing unnatural about hierarchies and there's nothing really unnatural about monarchy or anything like that now uh in america i think that the idea of monarchy is largely a non-starter um the, we're far too invested in uh representative democracy to have uh, any kind of conversation about monarchy really be taken seriously a as a viable option. Uh, he says that it must come from above, but not from below. In other words, that, that this, uh, that it can't come, where is, let's find the exact terminology. He says, obviously it cannot come from below, from the demos, uh, if anything, the very opposite. So, so he, and he uses the phrase elsewhere in this book, uh, um, a revolution from above in the idea that that it's not going to be the the common people uh, engaged in or forming some sort of a revolution or a restoration of traditional values it's going to be a, a sort of a natural aristocracy um, now 
for me personally, I think I like the idea of self-rule. I like I like representative democracy. I think that democracy can be dangerous, as we saw when we were talking about uh, uh, Yuval Levin's uh, book about about Edmund Burke. Edmund, Edmund Burke basically put forward the idea that a that a a pure democracy could hypothetically say, well, we want to be a monarchy one day and then the next day could switch and say, no, actually, we want to be a republic and then the next day switch back. No, no, we want to be a monarchy, that there's no stability in this fluctuation of the will of the of the masses, uh, just kind of changing the whole government on a whim. Uh, that's not a solid foundation and that is in no way a right-wing perspective. Uh, and so in that regard, uh, revolution from below uh, or from the, from the people, from the, the plebeian uh, approach, from the demos, is not really the correct approach to this, uh, to this revolution. So, so my point is that democ pure democracy does have weaknesses. It does have uh, a, a sort of an instability to it. And so it needs to be tempered through various means. Uh, such as the the existence of a representative democracy as opposed to a pure democracy, and sort of checks on the people's ability to just enact a tyranny a tyranny of the majority over the minority that the mi minority has certain protections and and whatnot. So there's a constitutional framework that encompasses uh, the the methods by which democracy can can manifest. So I think that the American system is actually pretty good, um, but it is important to to maintain a healthy skepticism of democracy. Uh, so while Evola may may sort of advance this aristocratic or or monarchical system uh, in America, we've got we we've got to kind of temper that and say, well, we can have a sort of a natural aristocracy via the uh, meritocratic system of the free market and of uh, capitalism and of of uh, of representative democracy so that the cream rises to the top so to speak and we can have an, a quasi aristocratic society that provides a, a sort of a sense of stability uh, that 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 kind of can act as a check on pure democracy and so that that restraint upon unbridled democracy is fundamental to being right wing um, and again does that not sort of come across as negative as opposed to a positive description of what right wing is that it's a well it's a check on democracy but 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 that's just in opposition to democracy. Well, what if there was no democracy? What would it be? And then it's, like, oh, it would be a monarchy. It would be an aristocracy. Um, and in reality, in America, we're, we're going to have to be a, a kind of a synthesis of a, a bit of an aristocratic, um, formulation tempered by, uh, by democracy. Those two things are going to have to work together. That's what our vision is going to have to look like because we do, I believe, have to be sort of pragmatic and practical about this whole thing. The idea that a monarchy could ever be established in the United States is, I mean, it's a waste of, waste of thought power. It's never going to happen, or at least it's not going to happen anytime in the next century, at least. Uh, the people of America just won't go for it. So, um, that's just not, that's not even a possibility. Uh, so, so there you have some some basic ideas uh, about how he understands what it means to be of the right. And then I think it's also interesting when he says that belonging to the right means being conservative, but not in a static sense. And this is really the only spot that I've found Evola talking about making any concessions to the present moment. And not just a diehard, uh, unyielding dedication to the systems of the past. That he says, okay, well, you, you have to be able to, you want to have a foundation of principles. That's kind of the bedrock. But these principles express themselves differently at different times in keeping with the, the changing scenarios. Um, he even says, uh, he says, uh, the claim that the right 
must not be characterized by static conservatism means. What it means is that certain values and underlying ideas must indeed be there as a firm foundation, but must be expressed in different ways in keeping with the times, so as to not let oneself be overtaken by them. This enables one to avoid being left behind, and to grasp, govern, and absorb anything that may emerge as the context changes. But that's the only way that people of the right should think about progress, just in that, in that as times change, the expression of these eternal principles uh, will change the method of expression. Uh, So I thought that was kind of an interesting thing that I really don't see him really anywhere else make much concession to the the changing tides of of, of fortune in the present. So with that said, we've we've got a sort of an idea of what Evola's version of the right wing means and the the way in which uh, the United States is going to or or would, would have to have its own kind of vision of the right wing because I think it needs any kind of ideal or vision needs to be in some to some degree attainable otherwise it's a it's an utter waste of time and waste of mental energy so when a, an achievable version of right wing in America would simply be to to say well we acknowledge that democracy is a part of our um, institute is an institution of ours and a part of our tradition but it has to remain uh, checked in order to have more uh, consistency from one day to the next, from one generation to the next, there has to be um, there has to be something more permanent than the whim of the people. So, in this next essay uh, from 1970, called "Psychoanalysis of the Protest," uh, he talks a little bit about. Uh, young people and the protest movements that were going on in Europe at that time. This essay is a little bit longer than some of the others, uh, but I think this is interesting. It brings up a little bit of uh, Carl Jung, and it brings up a little bit of, uh, of Friedrich Nietzsche. And so I think that it's Uh, sort of interesting and can be useful for us it's kind of a bit of a polemic but it's uh, it's uh, and it's also a little bit all over the place but it's it's interesting and then and let's read it and see what we can do with it so so he says one of he says quote one of the signs of the breakdown of contemporary culture is the attention paid to the so-called protest movement both in general and in its particular form as a youth movement This is not to say that the movement in question is of no importance, on the contrary, but is only of factual importance, as a token of the times, and it is exclusively in these terms that it ought to be considered. A violent reaction against the negative aspects of the contemporary world constitutes the mask of the currents in question. However, what better defines them is the fact that they consist of disorderly and anarchical instinctual reactions, which are in no way justified by that in the name of which this rejection and protest is taking place. Even when no subjection to Marxist or communist influences is apparent, the existential background of this youth protest is highly questionable. One of its well-known spokesmen, Cohn Bendit, claimed that what the protesters are fighting for is the new man, but he forgot to say what kind of man this might be, and should the vast majority of present-day protesters serve as a model for this new man in terms of their individuality, behavior, and choices, then one could only reply, thanks, but would rather do without it. Given the lack of any genuinely positive counterpart and the predominance of an irrational substrate, it would be fair to say that the protest movement requires not so much a cultural analysis as an existential psychoanalytical one. This seemed to be provided by a recently published volume entitled Psychodynamics of the Protest. The author, M. Moreno, is a scholar in the aforementioned field of modern psychological research. Reading this work, however, one soon realizes that such research ultimately lacks the principles required in order to reach any serious and plausible conclusion. 
as the defining feature of contemporary forms of protest, Moreno's study invokes anti-authoritarianism, and hence the defense of instinctiveness against all forms of repression, especially in the sexual field, followed by an anarchical orientation. In doing so, it does not go beyond the most obvious and ostentatious aspects, without touching upon the deep and unconscious impulses which constitute the domain of psychoanalysis. This domain is only approached when, after having defined the kind of system that is being opposed as patriarchal, with reference to the exercise of authority this entails, the famous Oedipus complex is brought into play. As is widely known, Freudian psychoanalysis dogmatically assumes that, within the context of a murky ancestral heritage revived by certain alleged childhood experiences, each of us suffers from this complex, which entails a revolt against one's father, verging on a desire to suppress him. The collective outburst of this latent complex would thus be one of the underground roots of the contemporary protest. This argument is hardly convincing. First of all, one would have to prove that the present system revolves around the ideal of the father and of his authority. At most, this might have been the case in Europe before the First World War, but the contemporary world is governed by democracy, socialism, egalitarianism, socialitarianism, and so on. Socio-political forms that go in an opposite direction, since, as others have rightly noted, they all possess a feminine and maternal character. What has a masculine and paternal character, by contrast, is the idea of a monarchical, aristocratic, and hierarchical state, few traces of which survive nowadays. But in order to refute and at the same time elucidate the Oedipian thesis, one may first of all turn to psychoanalysis itself, which acknowledges the ambiguity of the Oedipus complex. The person suffering from it does not simply hate his father, but also admires and envies him. He wishes to do away with his father simply in order to take his place and enjoy the same privileges as him. The underlying feature of the protest is precisely the fact that this last aspect is missing. The father is not at all admired or envied. No one wishes to take his place. The new generation sees red upon the sight of any form of authority. This brings out the other aforementioned characteristic of the protest, its purely hysterically anarchical aspect, everything else merely serving as a pretext for it. From a human point of view in general, this bears witness to a regressive phenomenon. People should make up their minds about the much deplored issue of repression once and for all. Plato argued that those who lack a sovereign principle within ought to at least have one without. Thus, any normal order entails certain limits, which are designed less to bind than to support those who are incapable of giving themselves any law, form, and discipline. Of course, a system may enter into crisis and fossilize. In that case, the limits in question may take a stubborn and merely repressive form in an attempt to stem the disorder and dissolution. In order to turn to protest, however, in this case, one ought to acquire legitimacy. In other words, to show that it is not simply a matter of aversion towards all forms of inner discipline, but rather of yearning for a more genuine life. Yet nothing of the sort is to be observed nowadays. What we observe instead are individuals identifying with the instinctive, irrational, and amorphous part of man, his underground, that part which in every higher human being is not stubbornly repressed, but rather held at a certain distance and in check. The links between the protest movement and the most spurious and promiscuous aspects of the so-called sexual revolution, just like the fact that it is in cahoots with hippie junkies and other such types, are certainly revealing, as is the spectacle offered by the many sectors in which the repressive system is increasingly being replaced by a permissive one. What use is being made of this new space, this new freedom? Here the symptoms multiply, showing that the revolt as a whole is influenced from below. It is the very opposite of that essentially aristocratic form of revolt 
that still distinguished some individualists of the previous generation, starting with Nietzsche, the best Nietzsche. It is worth quoting a few lines here from this author, who is never quoted by today's protesters, who, at most, are hung up on writers like Marcusa, as they instinctively perceive the different nature, the aristocratic character, of Nietzsche's far broader revolt. Zarathustra states, You call yourself free, your dominating thought I want to hear, and not that you escaped from a yoke. Are you the kind of person who had the right to escape from a yoke? There are some who threw away their last value when they threw away their servitude. Free from what? What does Zarathustra care? But brightly, your eyes should signal to me, free for what? Zarathustra warns us that being free, enjoying an amorphous personal freedom, can amount to doom and catastrophe. Therefore, the driving force and psychodynamics of the protest movement would appear to lie in that dark zone, that elementary, subpersonal, and subintellectual substrate of the human being, which is the focus of psychoanalysis. What we have is the regressive and explosive emergence of these layers, in parallel to the manifold fracturing of a world in crisis. Acknowledging the questionable and deplorable aspects of this world makes no difference when a revolutionary movement lacks the values required for a genuine restoration and is not led by a human type that embodies a higher legitimacy, all we can expect from it is a transition to an even more critical and destructive stage than the one which existed at the start. As the present remarks have been inspired by Moreno's slim volume, in moving towards a conclusion we should like to note that, after having presented the purely Freudian, Oedipian interpretation of the unconscious substrate of the protest, this professor of psychiatry partly criticizes and rejects it. Moreno rather believes that one should draw upon a theory formulated by C.G. Young. As is widely known, Young holds rather different ideas from Freud. Borrowing Plato's concept of the archetype and of the metaphysical plane, Young has transposed them to the level of the so-called collective unconscious. According to this view, Typical dynamic structures, the archetypes, lie dormant in the collective unconscious, deep within all individuals, and can resurface in critical individuals or collective conditions, carrying people away. Several of these archetypes are said to exist, which are also connected to certain symbolic figures. One of them is the eternal boy, an embodiment of the pre-conscious and native aspect of the collective soul, which like a young boy, is the future in potency, and hence a principle of renewal, the restoration of all that an individual or culture has rejected or repressed in terms of vital naturalness. According to Moreno, in the light of psychoanalysis, the protest movement may be seen to reflect an uncomfortable re-emergence of this archetype, the eternal boy within the new generation, which no longer identifies with the outdated symbols imposed by the system. All in all, then, Moreno's verdict is a positive one. In order to follow Moreno in his overstretched interpretation, we should start by taking Young's mythology seriously. In fact, we reject it, as much as Freud's, for well-founded reasons, which we have expounded elsewhere. Ultimately, this quirk of the eternal boy seems to be in line with the fetishization of youth, or youthism, another regressive contemporary phenomenon. The idea of clearing the way for young people, regarded as the voice of the future and the harbingers of new, genuine values, and of learning from them instead of educating and training them. This fetishization, extended even to children, has already emerged, along with anti-authoritarian considerations, with the pedagogy of Monteresi and other pedagogues. It was then further developed with the discovery of the child as creator, artist, and so on. With Young, the boy acquired the rank of an archetype, and as we have seen in Moreno's interpretation of a positive revolutionary archetype. Freud's essentially amusing picture of the infant as polymorphously perverse has therefore been overturned. 
On our part, we are willing to accept the idea of the eternal boy at work in the subconscious of the protesters, according to Moreno's perspective, but only if we take the child as a child, demythologizing him, and hence with reference to an extremely annoying form of primitivism or childishness. It would be high time, then, to send this boy, eternal or not, to bed, no matter how virulent or overbearing he may be, were it not that we live in a defeatist world. End quote. Okay, so that's a kind of an interesting uh, approach to the youth protests of the time, and, and fairly critical, uh, but I like how he kind of goes into Jung a little bit. Uh, Freud, he goes into Freud and Jung, and b briefly talks about Nietzsche. Uh, he's, he seems to be much more positively inclined toward the ideas of Nietzsche. Um, and he doesn't seem extremely critical of Jung's ideas, maybe not quite so much as he is critical of Freud, uh, but he also talks about how the eternal boy, um, the archetype of the eternal boy postulated by Jung, uh, is not something that should be striven after, but instead should be, uh, perhaps put in its place or, or, uh, or rejected that the, the youth protests, uh, are using this idea of the of the eternal boy. Now, this is he's he's talking about someone else's um, an essay by someone else called uh, "Psychodynamics of the Protest," and this one is called "Psychoanalysis of the Protest." So, obviously, it's a it's a response to this other essay, um, which would probably be a pretty interesting essay to read. Uh, but but so this comes to a certain point of of the fetishization of youth or youthism. Uh, the idea that young people, that we should be learning from young people instead of educating and training them. And I think that's an important point because he talks a little bit here and, and, and elsewhere about the fetishization of youth and the idea that people should be elevating the young to this point of, uh, of, a. uh, uh, uh mythologized or, or put on a pedestal that young people should be educating older people rather than older people educating younger people as is the natural order. And so the eternal boy is something that should not be set up as something that we all strive to uh, strive to represent or or embody, but instead something that that we ha we understand as a subordinate, a subordinate archetype or a subordinate role. And he also talks a little bit about the Oedipus complex, and he talks about how the desire is to uh, to do away with the father, but also that the father is admired and envied, and therefore to replace the father. And he says that the that in the youth protest, there's no desire to replace the father. It's all just pure anarchy. In other words, there's no desire to set up a new replacement authority. But this was written in 1970. In the modern world, I think we can see that the, the, the protest movements of the 60s and 70s unleashed and promoted ideas that have, in fact, attempted to become dogmatic and have attempted to impose themselves in a somewhat authoritarian manner. If you look at the this, the, the quasi totalitarian approach of the modern left, um, so I think he kind of gets that wrong. That maybe that it was just so wild and rambunctious and anarchical um, uh, back then, but that's not the way it is now. Obviously, we still have like Antifa and what have you, uh, but they they are trying to not just burn the whole thing down. They are trying to set themselves up as the new authority. Uh, so Evel is wrong about that, but that this was decades ago, and that may not have made itself apparent at that time. And then when he brings up Nietzsche, uh, he talks about Nietzsche in the sense of, uh, again, the sort of... Uh, the sort of a, a quote from Thus Spake Zarathustra, 
where he says, uh, he says, free from what? What does Zarathustra care? Brightly your eyes should signal to me free for what? In other words, it's pointless to simply uh, break free from restraints if you don't have some sort of positive uh, formulation of what you are going to replace you that that which you have freed yourself from uh, with. What is your and that goes along kind of along with that trial of error approach that we saw in that other essay. But there is a part in here that he talks about the difference between biological youth and spiritual youth. And I'll just make a quick mention of that. I'm not going to read the portion of it because it's not, uh, it's just not set up um, in a way that, that flows well to read. But uh, he does talk about how the sense of vitality and the sense of uh, enthusiasm and openness to uh, to new experience, etc. Much of the the qualities that we often attribute to youth can and should be preserved by a person well into their old age. And this sort of represents a spiritual youth that a person who's older could still be considered youthful in their temperament and that it's not just a matter of their actual age. Uh, and, and so we should be valuing that sort of a spiritual youth more so than we are, than we our current scenario where what we really chase after is biological youth. We try to copy the styles of the youth. We try to make ourselves look youthful. And we talk all the time, especially the, the progressive left, about how the youth are the future and we want to lower the voting age to 16 because, you know, there's this, this sort of um, pure innocence of young people, that young people have this uh, base of wisdom in them that they lose as they get older that that when you're young and you're in your 16 or 18 or, or or whatever in your early 20s that these young you know protesters and, and whatnot they know everything and and uh and we need to listen to them and not listen to these old folks who uh who have steadily um, become stupider as they've gotten older and that's a total inversion of the natural order in which Older people have acquired. I mean, they, they may have lost some of the of the things, the the beauty or whatever that they had, and the the you know the use of their joints <laughs> or whatever that they had in their youth. In their youth, but they, as they've lost some of the things of, of youth, they've gained something which is uh, stature and status and respect and wisdom, um, and uh, and 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 the new approach of of elevating the youth and and denigrating and disregarding um the the older generations and the values of them it's more it's more become kind of like well we're just going to wait for you all to die off so that we can you know we can do things our way it's a, it's a total inversion of the way that that um the natural way of the world the way that we have existed throughout history and and much of the rest of the world that isn't wrapped up in this progressivism continues to operate continues to have this respect for elders um and that that inversion is one of the most damaging things that has come out of progressivism uh but it's it's uh you know it's easy to if you can position yourself into into control of the school system, it's fairly easy to sculpt the minds of this kind of the putty of the minds of the youth to whichever way you want. When you control what the young people think through through media and through education and through all these different means, uh, of course you want to elevate the young because they're your foot soldiers. Um, you don't want to uh, value the, the the people who you know are older because they're of the past, and the past is what you're trying to eliminate. Um, 
and and so a, a conservative or a right wing orientation and disposition. While we should definitely value that that so called spiritual youth, and we should value that sense of vitality, and we should embrace it, and we should be it, and we should live it, and we should. You know, we, we definitely should try to draw young people into right wing ideas and uh, and use their vitality and their enthusiasm. Uh, we also need to need to maintain that sort of respect for elders. And there's kind of a positive aspect to this. It's to go off on a slight tangent here. If you think about it, uh, the progressive left has has denigrated so much of the past and 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 has elevated so much of that which is new that everything from the past has become toxic. The, the founding fathers are toxic. The every every ph- philosophical idea that has been put forward in the past is all tainted and toxic and, and needs to be called out and purged from society and replaced with the newest of the new. That, in a way, works to our advantage if you look at it from a certain angle to, to say that, okay, well, in that case, Everything from the past, everything that has ever happened in every aspect of society is ours. Those are our tools. Every idea of the Enlightenment, those are our tools. The ro- Romantic movement, those are our tools. You know, uh, that that's a kind of value. And what does the progressive have left but uh, j- but just the, the the creation of something that has never really even uh, existed before. It's always on the new. It's always the promotion of the new. Uh, that leaves them sort of empty-handed in a way. They don't have established tools because everything that becomes old becomes corrupt, right? And so, all right, those are all in our hands. Now, it's a bit of a, a tangent, but it's food for thought. So, uh, I guess that's all I'm going to say about this book uh, the, there's a number of parts in here that are that are pretty good, and then there's a few parts that I'm like, ah, I'm not so sure about that. But but for the most part, it's pretty good stuff. Um, so so pick it up and check it out. And, and one last thing that I want to mention that I really uh, one of the reasons that I really find myself drawn to to Evla and and have come back to review a second book of his is the his boldness. His boldness, even in the 1960s, 1970s, still talking about the value of monarchy and aristocracy. He doesn't care. He's not trying to shape his ideas for this or that, uh, what's going to be accepted or, or watering it down. He doesn't water it down at all, ever. He's just bold. And he, and he says, yes, uh, I am right wing. This is right wing. This is what it means. This is what I promote, and and uh, and I and I, I respect it. You know, I value that. Um, I think that's something that we need uh, in our modern American conservatism and right wing movements to to have that boldness that Evola had to try to emulate that. Because I hear about so many people, and I read about so many people so often uh, through one avenue or another, basically saying, "Oh well, yeah, you know, I'm." I am conservative, but I have to hide my beliefs. I can't, you know, I'm a student at university and I'm a conservative student at a university and I have to hide my conservatism. And to me, that's just, it it reeks of patheticness. Don't be a coward. Stand up for your beliefs. Um, You know, there's nothing that that is more, I mean, especially if you're talking about young people, you know, um, plant your flag, man. Uh, stand up for what you believe in and take advantage of the of the vitality of youth to represent your cause and don't hide, you know, or whatever, whether it's you, you've got to hide in your place of employment because you're worried about the ramifications and repercussions. But let me tell you something, the left, the progressives are bold, they're uh, brazen in their ideas, and uh, they really don't hide. They've never really hidden their beliefs, unless they were hiding in a specific, you know, objective to be subversive and to infiltrate uh, institutions. If they have a reason to hide for some greater cause in some cases, but for the most part, they've been vocal, loud and proud. And, and for us to be timid is just not acceptable. There is an ideological war 
going on for the soul of the country, and there's no room in this for people to be timid. Take a look at Evola and 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 embrace that that just uh, going again that that tenor of going against the grain. Uh, damn the consequences. Um, be a man among the ruins is one of his one of his uh, his phrases. Men among the ruins. Be that. Don't fold. You got one life. Stand up. Have a backbone. Um, even if it's unpopular. Even if you're out there talking about how we need to bring back monarchy. Whatever. Whatever ridiculous idea you have that you think. I mean, say it loud and proud. Whatever you do, don't be timid. There's no room for timidity. And there's no respect for the timid. You don't deserve respect for being timid. Um, so don't go around telling people, oh, I'm conservative, but I can't say anything because I'm afraid. Uh, that's not respectable. I'm sorry. That's how I feel. So, uh, so yeah, that's all I'm going to say about that. And I'm going to wrap up this podcast. You could find me on social media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, or my, my main avenues. I do have a Patreon page if you want to support the show. I have a website, neofusionist.com, where I, um, p- periodically post some writings other than, um, but, but mostly I just post the, uh, links to the podcast, but uh, I do have some other thoughts that I put on there if you want to go check that out as well. Um, The main deal, though, is the podcast, so I hope that you come back next time for our next episode. And that's all for now. Thanks for sticking around. I'll talk to you next time. Bye.